Greetings, happy Sabbath day. This is April 28, 2017, the uh, Sabbath. I usually try to get the studies done on the Sabbath. I figure if I'm going to do some work, this is a good time to do it. I must apologize for not doing many studies. I've been busy trying to consider my options and relocating, but enough of that. Today's Bible study is going to be called On Eagle's Wings. Now, an eagle is the symbol of the American bird. It figures prominently. Uh, the bald eagle is the symbol of America, as many of you know. It was also a symbol of Rome. And the Bible has a few things to say about eagles as well. Now, let's take a look at what the Bible has to say about eagles. Well, let's see. In Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 13, And these are they which shall which ye shall have in abomination among the fowls. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle and the osprey and the osprey. And the osprey is basically a water eagle. So eagles were not to be used for food. They're known as birds of prey. And no, we're not talking about the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. No, no, not that kind of prey. When I say a bird of prey, uh, prey, I'm talking about predators and prey. And an eagle is a predator. Matter of fact, an eagle can... Uh, they, from what I understand, the only natural... Um, the only natural in nature, the only true predator an eagle has is mankind. And that was only since the invention of, you know, gunpowder and guns. I mean, sure, you know, you can poison them, but, but uh, you know, an eagle, they, they ride the currents. They're high up in the trees, and there's not many things that can attack and kill an eagle. Matter of fact, golden eagles are absolutely huge. They can have six-foot wingspans, and they've been known to kill wolves, coyotes. They've been known to... There's a YouTube video of a golden eagle dragging a goat off the side of a mountain. You know, goat's a 30, you know, 25, 30 pound, 35 pound animal. You know, mountain goat. Just grabbed it, swooped down, grabbed it by the neck, and then dragged it off the side of a mountain, and it fell to its death and had, you know, lunch. But an eagle, an eagle can prey upon, it's a predator, and it preys upon, Snakes, poisonous snakes, sea snakes, rattlesnakes, they can, you know. Matter of fact, uh, Mexico has their symbol as an eagle also with a uh, one of, uh, snake in one of its claws. So what does the Bible say about snakes or serpents? Well, in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9, we read the following. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent. Why was he old? Because he'd been around for a long, long time. I mean, think about it. Genesis 3, the talking serpent, right? That talked to Eve, talked her into eating the fruit that the Lord had told her not to eat. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, 
which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So, eagles prey upon serpents. Keep that thought in mind as we continue with the study. All right, let's go to the book of Exodus. All right, in, um, well, before we get going here, reading Exodus, let me mention something. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, Paul writes to Timothy and says, study, study, not just read, but study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And, you know, a word of caution, if you think the seven dispensations and dispensational theology is rightly dividing the word of truth, well, i tell you what. They believe that during the tribulation period, after the so-called pre-trib rapture, they teach that to be saved, you have to keep the law. And Paul said, if anybody came and preached any other gospel, let them be accursed. Well, guess what? Keeping the law during the tribulation period for under dispensational theology, you know, Clarence Larkin and Schofield, that's cursed, people. It's dispensational, there's two dispensations. There was the dispensation of Moses, which was the law, and then there was the dispensation under Christ, which is grace. Most people divide it and call it the Old and New Testaments. There's only two dispensations. There's law, and then there was grace. And let me tell you something. People in the Old Testament were not saved by the law. They were saved by faith. The same way that they were saved in the New Testament. It's just that the Redeemer had not come yet. So, uh, so the Bible tells you to study. And, you know, if you've never read the entire Bible from cover to cover, you're doing yourself an extreme disservice. And as a matter of fact, there's a good chance that Satan will be able to deceive you. And if Satan can deceive you on something major, there's a good chance you can believe in Jesus and go to hell. Oh, you don't believe that? I tell you what. Let's take a look at something. Well, let's take a look at this. In Matthew chapter 7, and verse, starting in verse 20, Jesus speaking said, Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. And he's not talking about, you know, people that sell apples, okay? Uh, Dole Fruit Company, no, no. When he says by their fruits, he's talking about our works. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. What? We got to do something? Yeah, we got to do the will of the Father which is in heaven. I mean, let's face it, people, if, if you're worshiping Satan and kidnapping babies and killing them and sacrificing on an altar to Satan, and then, and, and then you're going to church on Sunday and calling Jesus Lord, uh, I, don't think, I don't think it's going to, you know, and you say, well, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, but you're not serving the Lord, you're serving the devil. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Oh yeah, on TBN, we prophesied in your name. 
And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Oh, and another thing too, uh, a lot of people will say that Paul was a false apostle. Now, when you read that in, in 2 Timothy, um, you know, where he tells you to study, would a false apostle tell you to study the Bible? Really? Really? How about a verse before it? 2 Timothy 2, 12. Paul writes Timothy, if we suffer, if we suffer for what? If we suffer for Christ, okay? If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Well, who's him? Him is Christ, people. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Want to need, you, want to, you want to take a look at a second uh, witness? How about Matthew chapter 10? Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 10. Let's, let's take a look at verse 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. Oh boy, don't you hear that on Christmas time? Uh, peace on earth. Goodwill towards men. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Oh, yeah. Jesus didn't come to send peace on earth. There's going to be war, people. So, if we deny Christ to save our hides... Before men, he's going to deny us. He's going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So, very important. We have to do the will of the Father and believe on the Lord. All right, so let's take a look. Now, the reason I was saying read the Bible is, you know, if you've never read the Bible cover to cover, you know, I, I just, you know, I try to keep my studies an hour or less. I try. And the problem is, if you don't understand what the Lord did in Egypt, to the Egyptians when Israel was in captivity and bondage, they were slaves, and how the first Passover and, and how the plagues of the frogs and the plagues of the lice and the plagues of the flies, you know, how the blood turned, to, uh, water turned to blood. I mean, you know, if you don't know these stories, you know, when you read the New Testament, it doesn't make that much sense. So, you know, the, the Lord sent Moses to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and said, let my people go. Now, I'm just going to mention this briefly, and if you want to do a study of it, you can. Um, when Noah, after the flood, when he got drunk and Ham looked upon his, uh, saw his father's nakedness and uh, Noah cursed Canaan, who was Ham's son. Well, you know, uh, Egypt was called the land of Ham in the book of Psalms. I believe it was the book of Psalms. And... Uh, you know, what's funny is uh, 
the land where uh, Ham's family families ended up were areas in the Bible where God either commanded the children of Israel to totally exterminate them, like the Canaanites, the children of Canaan. And, uh, well, let's face it, Ham. Ham was Egypt. All right, so, you know, I, it's on my to-do list one day, you know, but um, I tell you what, it's, it's hard to work a full-time job and uh, do Bible studies, and plus all the other stuff, family stuff. You know, and, and I don't do this for money, so, you know, what can I tell you? All right, I'm just going to read some things. Exodus chapter 5 and verse 1. And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And then in, but Pharaoh didn't do it, you know, he didn't do it. Exodus 7, verse 16. And thou shalt say unto him, who? Pharaoh. Moses should say this to Pharaoh. And thou shalt say unto him, the Lord God of the Hebrews hath sent me unto thee, saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. And behold, hitherto thou wouldest not hear. Exodus 8.1 And the Lord spake unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Exodus 8.20 Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he cometh forth to the water and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. See, the Hebrews were serving Pharaoh, not the Lord. So the Lord saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Verse 21. Else... Exodus 8.21. We just read 8.20. Else, if thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies upon thee, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thy houses, and the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies, and also the ground whereon they are. Exodus 9, verse 1. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh and tell him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. You see, God would, was showing Pharaoh in Egypt that he was in control. Matter of fact, I did a whole Bible study on the plagues of Egypt and how they compare and contrast to the book of Revelation. It's on my playlist. You know, the plagues of Revelation. A lot of similarities there. But, uh, you know, I put a lot of lot of time and effort putting this, this information together, you know, and, and I don't beg you people for money, so, you know. And uh, YouTube's been dinging me, so, uh, you know, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be on YouTube. I really don't. I'm not going to delete my channel, but they might do it for me. And I'm working. And if anybody wants to help me uh, set up a website on a website that I'm, you know, let me know. I'd appreciate uh, any help. All right. Uh, let's see. Exodus 9.13, And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Exodus 10.3, And Moses and Aaron came in unto Pharaoh and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. 
you know, there was uh, what, like seven, I think there was seven plagues. I, I, I haven't counted them, but there was lice, there were flies, uh, the water was turned to blood, uh, the locusts, you know, oh, okay, uh, Exodus 10, 4, next verse. Let my people go that they may serve me. Else, if thou refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring the locusts into thy coast. And, you know, he brought the hail that was mingled with fire. I mean, Egypt was just about destroyed. You know, and the locusts, locusts are horrible people. If you're a farmer, locusts will eat every green thing in your field. I mean, in uh, locusts can turn midday, noon, bright summer day, black, because there will be so many of them. And Egypt was always known as the breadbasket of the Middle East because of the Nile River. Fresh water, you could take the desert, give it fresh water, and Plants will grow there. Food, crops, they grew wheat. As a matter of fact, uh, they found some dried kernels of wheat in one of the Egyptian tombs in one of the pyramids. Uh, you know, like a bowl of wheat. And they did genetic testing on it. And it's almost identical to the non-GMO wheat that we have today. But not only that, uh, one of the researchers got interested and he planted a few of these, you know, grains of wheat that were, you know, thousands of years old. They sprouted and they grew. Isn't that amazing? I, I thought it was amazing. So, all right. So you got the idea. The Lord is challenging Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt. You know, because, uh, believe it or not, Beelzebub, you've heard that name? Uh, he's called the Lord of the Flies. He was one of the Egyptian gods of the flies. They had all kinds of different gods. All the plagues in Egypt was a challenge to the gods of Egypt. You had a god of the Nile, and you had a god of the frogs. And, uh, matter of fact, the mouth, what is it, out of the mouth of the beast, the mouth of the false prophet, and the mouth of the dragon, there were three, three unclean spirits like frogs come out of its mouth. You know, there's a lot of symbolism. You know, you, you cannot comprehend the New Testament very well if you don't understand the Old Testament. So, what can I tell you, people? All right, so, God has Moses and Aaron... And Moses was a Levite, by the way. There were 12 tribes of Israel. Levi was the priest tribe. They were the tribe that was to serve the Lord in the tabernacle and in the temple, later in the temple. They were the ones that gave the law. Whereas Judah was the tribe of the kings. That's where David and Christ came from. They were the civil rulers. They were sort of like uh, the president and the Congress. Or if you're from the UK, the House of Lords, House, House of Lords and the uh, Prime Minister or the King or the Queen, for that matter. So, all right, let's take a look. Uh, let's go to Exodus chapter 11, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh. Now you got to realize, they've had the water turn to blood. They've had the, the hail with fire that burned, crushed and burned up the crops. Lice, flies, water turning in the blood. I mean, Egypt's just about destroyed. And the Lord said unto Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt, 
Afterward, he will let you go hence, and he shall let you go. He shall surely thrust you out hence altogether. In other words, he's not only going to let you go, he's going to push you out the door. Speak now in the ears of the people, and let every man borrow, take, and let every man borrow of his neighbor, and every woman of her neighbor, jewels of silver and jewels of gold. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt. And all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maid servant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beasts. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall like uh, shall be like it any more. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that ye may know how that the Lord doth put a difference, how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. Remember, people, the Egyptians were of the tri uh, were of Ham. God cursed Canaan, who was Ham's son. Maybe I'll point that out later. But Verse 8. And all these thy servants shall come down unto me and bow down themselves unto me, saying, Get thee out, and all the people that follow thee. And after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in a great anger. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Let me tell you something, people. When you don't listen to the Lord, sometimes he'll, he will harden your heart. And when he does that, you're lost. You're gone. Your fate is sealed. That's why the Bible says, harden not your heart. And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Egypt, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not, so that he would not let the children of Israel go out of his land. Ooh. In the book of Psalms, chapter 95 and verse 8, we read, Harden not your heart, as in the provocation, and as in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. Okay, is there a New Testament? Scripture for this? Hebrews 3 and verse 8. Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation and the day of temptation in the wilderness. Hebrews 3.15 While it is said, today, if ye will hear his voice. Today, if ye will hear his voice. Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. Hmm. You know, smart to listen. And don't harden your heart. Because when you do, and you refuse to be listened, and you're stiff-necked, and you won't listen to the Lord, there comes a point in time when the Lord will give you, will give you up to a reprobate mind. That means the Lord gives up on you. And that means your fate is sealed. You're doomed. It's over. I don't know when that line is crossed. 
I'm not an expert on those things, that's for sure. So what is provocation? Well, it's an action or a speech that makes someone annoyed or angry, especially when you do something deliberately. Uh, for example, synonyms, goading, prodding, egging on, incitement. Uh, you should remain calm and not respond to provocation. I guess a way, uh, that's like provoking. Provocation is sort of like provoking, so. So, you get the idea? You know? Harden not your hearts. As in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. Oh, yeah. In the book of Romans, chapter 9, and verse 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for the same purpose have I, God, even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. You see, the, the Lord raised up Pharaoh and put him in power so that he might have, his glory might be declared. And Pharaoh hardened his heart a number of times. But the last time, the Lord hardened his heart. And that was the first Passover of what I ju had just previously read last time concerning the book of Exodus. So all the firstborn in Egypt died. All of Israel, well, they had taken the blood of the lamb, put the blood on the doorpost, and the angel of death passed over those that had the blood of the lamb. How interesting. Is it, Jesus was called the lamb of God, wasn't he? John the Baptist, he said, behold, when he saw, when he, when he saw Christ, he he declared, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And guess what, people? When the angel of death sees the blood of the Lamb, didn't Jesus say he was the door? Yes, he did. He says, I, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any will open unto me, him I will go in unto him and sup with him, and he will sup with me. Jesus said he was the good shepherd. He's the, the door to the pasture of the flock. And when we have that blood of the lamb at the door, the death angel is going to pass over us. Not so with the world that doesn't have the blood of the lamb. Look out. All right, let's go back. All right, so here's the punchline, people. In Exodus chapter 12 and 13, well, guess what? The death angel comes. All the firstborn in the land of Egypt dies. Everybody that didn't have the blood of the lamb on their doorpost suffered a loss. If they had a dog and the dog had a litter of puppies, the first one died. If a man and a wife had three children, the first one died. If a man was a rancher and he had 20 cattle and um, five of them were firstborn from different times, they all died. Pharaoh lost, I believe, a son. There was not one house in the land of Egypt that didn't suffer a loss. And you better believe when they all start talking to each other like, wow, you lost your firstborn, so did I. And they got to the point where they said, you know what? Let's kick these Hebrews out of here so we, we do all don't die. 
So then they left. They left Egypt. They were given gold. They were given silver, uh, jewels. And Pharaoh and his people kicked them out, said, get out of here. Please leave before we all be dead men. Oh, yeah. Let's take a look. Now, I, uh, I did a thing on, uh, I've done a lot of Bible studies. I can't even keep track of them. I've, I have over 700 right now. A lot of the early ones were slideshows with just basically slideshows of reading verses. But about half of them are uh, audio but if you want to go into the uh, what happened in Egypt, take a look at my playlist. So, let's see where we're going to start here. Let's go to Exodus chapter 12, 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all, and against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am the Lord. The gods of Egypt, the fallen angels people. Egypt had so many different gods. I don't know how many of you watch uh, uh, SG-1, Stargate. Perhaps you've heard the names Anubis, Ra, Set, uh, Hathor. I mean, all those were gods of Egypt. But they weren't gods. They were the fallen angels. You know, Ra was the sun god. Uh, let's see. I forget the name of the god of the dead. Well, perhaps as you've heard of the Egyptian Book of the Dead, you know. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be, a, uh, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. How long's forever? Well, if we're going to have eternal life forever, uh, forever. Now, you know, let me say something here. There's a lot of things the Hebrew roots people will teach. And, you know, I, I despise Easter. Okay. I absolutely hate Easter. You know, bunny rabbits and, and eggs. And, and, you know, if Christ was crucified on Passover and he rose again on the third day, if, if Easter's not three days after Passover, well, then it's, it's not the resurrection of Christ. It can't be. And yes, it is a pagan, satanic, unholy day. But the thing is, you know, we should honor the Lord. Maybe we don't want to sacrifice a lamb and take the blood and put it on the doorpost. You know, the Lord did the Lord's Supper. He took bread. He, he blessed it. They ate of the bread, the unleavened bread. They drank of the wine. And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant, which I make for you, for many. I'm paraphrasing. You know, we should honor that. I believe that with all my heart. But the thing is with the Hebrew roots people, they're quick to point out all the deficiencies 
you know, like Easter and Christmas and, you know, they'll point those things out. But they'll never tell you about the filth in the Jewish Talmud where the writings of the rabbis say horrible blasphemies against Jesus. And the Talmud does have some interesting uh, writings in it. I mean, a matter of fact, there's some rabbis that when I read that, I was like, you know, these writings, there are commentaries on the Old Testament. Like, there's a, one rabbi that's mentioned in the, uh, the book of Acts. His name was Gamaliel. He was a, Paul was one of his students. I read some of his writings in the Talmud. It, I think that guy was an absolute brilliant Old Testament scholar. And according to legend, tradition, history, I don't know, he got saved. I, I don't know if it's true. It's not in the Bible, but I'd like to think so. Um, but looking for wisdom in the Talmud is sort of like looking for a diamond in a pit of sewage. You know, you got to get filthy dirty to find that, that diamond. Personally, I think your time's better spent reading the Bible. But that's just one person's opinion. But the uh, Hebrew Roots people will never warn you about the filth of the Talmud. They'll never tell you about Kabbalah, K-A-B-A-L-L, -L, I'm sorry, K-A-B-A-L-A-H, K-A-B-B-A-L-A-H. There's different ways to spell it. Sometimes they spell it with a C, sometimes with a Q, sometimes with a K, A, B, B, A, L, A, H. That's the more modern spelling. It's basically witchcraft and Satanism, magic, conjuring demons. And there's a whole, the largest so-called Orthodox Jewish group called Chabad Lubavitch, C-H-A-B-A-D, uh, they practice this stuff. And the Messianic Jews will never, never, never condemn it. I've never, ever heard a Messianic Jew come out and condemn the Lubavitch, the Chabad Lubavitch people and Kabbalah. Never. I've heard them say, well, we don't practice that. Well, guess what? I don't practice child sacrifice on an altar to Satan and then perform cannibalism. Just because you don't practice something doesn't mean, you know, you, I'm against Satanism. I don't care if you call it Judaism, Christianity. I don't care. You can label it whatever you want. I'm against it. But if you're not careful, the Hebrew Roots people, they will have you learning things out of the Kabbalah, and the Talmud before you know it. They do the switcheroo real quick. Beware, people. If, if they can't show you things like the Shekinah, S-H-E-K-I-N-A-H, in the Bible, and by the way, the Shekinah is the feminine side of God, the Queen of Heaven, they won't tell you that. Oh, the Shekinah, that's the glory of God. Yeah, the Queen of Heaven. The female side of God. Did you know that? It's not God the Father. Don't get me started. You know, they do have some good points. But Satan loves to mix truth with error. It's what he's, he's really good at it. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. So how long should we keep it? Forever. And then it talks about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You know, in Exodus chapter 12. Let's skip down to verse 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Egypt, uh, I'm sorry, elders of Israel, and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the base, that basin, and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to 
come in unto your houses to smite you. And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. You know, I, my opinion is people that try to honor the Lord with Passover instead of Easter and the Sabbath instead of Sunday. And I'm not saying it's wrong. It's not, you know, you want to worship the Lord on Sunday, it's not wrong. Monday, it's not wrong. Tuesday, it's not wrong. Wednesday, it's not wrong. Thursday, Friday, it's not wrong. But those that set aside the Sabbath day, the seventh day, if you don't know what the seventh day is, look on your calendar. It'll show you. Let's see. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Hmm. Even your calendar tells you what the day, the seventh day is. You know, take that day off, relax, rest, meditate on the Lord and his works. That's the day you do your studies, you know, teach the children, you know, instead of trying to make a buck, lay up treasures in heaven. You know, uh, I just read something the other day. A liberal church will tell you to come as you are and no change necessary. A legalistic church will tell you, you have to change before the Lord will accept you. But the true church will say, come to the Lord the way you are and the Lord will change you. And boy, that is so true. You know, when I, I came to the Lord, I was, there was some things I was good on, and then there were some things I was very worldly. And you know what? Today, after 25 plus years, I can't stand to watch television. I can't stand to listen to the music that I grew up with, that I loved. I, I just can't take it. It just makes me sick. And the things that I used to do, I, I just want to get on my face and, and cry. So, you know, when you come to the Lord and you're truly saved, the Holy Spirit, will, it'll, he'll clean you up. So, yeah, a liberal church will tell you you don't have to change. Legalistic church will tell you you have to change before the Lord will take you and but the true church, God will change you from the inside out. God will do it. All right, so, verse 25. And it shall come to pass, when ye be come to the land which the Lord will give you, according as he hath promised, that ye shall keep the service. And it shall come to pass, when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? In other words, what's going on? What does this mean? What's the meaning of this? That ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses, and the people bowed the head and worshipped. And how much more should we bow our heads and worship that the Lord, the Lamb of God, suffered on the cross to save us. You know, and, and people try think they're honoring the Lord by, by having an Easter egg hunt from a bunny that pooped out chocolate eggs um, and then go home and have a ham dinner for Easter. And they think they're honoring the Lord. You know what? I think the Christmas Easter crowd, I think those are the ones that when in the time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation, I think those are the ones that are going to have to pay for their faith with their lives. And if they deny the Lord to save their, their lives, they're going to be in trouble. In the 8th chapter of Mark, verse 34, 
And when he, Jesus, and when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. Did you catch that? But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Back to Exodus 12, verse 28. And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Do you know that in every house in Egypt there was at least one death? And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go! Serve the Lord as ye have said. Also, take your flocks and your herds, have ye said, and be gone, and be gone, and bless me also. And the Egyptians were urgent, and the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, We be all dead men. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent unto them such thing as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth about 600 thousand on foot that were men beside children. 600,000 men. Not children, just men. How many children was that? How many women was that? Do you realize it was probably over a million people that left Egypt from the 12 families of Israel? I forget, I think it was like 470 years. So in 470 years, they went from 12 families to over a million. And a mixed multitude went up also with them, and flocks and herds, even very much cattle. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough, which they brought forth out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry, neither had they prepared for themselves any victual. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt were 430 years. And it came to pass at the end, oh, I'm sorry, that wasn't 470, it was 430. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. And it was a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt, that this is that night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof. But every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. A foreigner and an hired servant shall not eat thereof. In one house shall it be eaten. They shall not carry forth out Aught of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall ye break a bone thereof. Remember, Christ didn't have a bone broken. There was, 
I, I'm not sure I understand why. Uh, but, you know, Christ was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So, verse 47. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. Okay, so, why am I dwelling on this 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 exodus? You know, we're talking about eagles, right? Where does all this stuff fit in? So, all the people of Egypt, they kick Israel out. They kick them out. They go to the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army follows to go get them and bring them back. You know, afterward, they're like, Man, what did we let these people go for? We we need these slaves. Let's let's go get them back and bring them back to Egypt. You know, and then Moses parted the Red Sea. And if you listen to a bunch of liberal preachers, they'll tell you that uh, Moses and uh, children of Israel they didn't really cross the Red Sea. It was the Sea of Reeds. And the Sea of Reeds, they're saying, well, you know, it was only four, five, six inches of water. And they didn't really part the Red Sea and cross on dry ground. They just crossed this little shallow, you know, water. So really, it wasn't a miracle. Well, actually, it was. If they didn't cross the Red Sea and they crossed the Sea of Reeds that was only, you know, four, five, six inches deep. I don't know how many, how many centimeters is that? I don't know. 60, 90, 120, 150 centimeters. I don't know. It wasn't very deep. You know, you're talking ankle deep water. Okay? Ankle deep water. They crossed the Sea of Reeds, right? Well, that's not a miracle that the children of Israel crossed ankle deep water. But you know what is a miracle? Pharaoh's army drowned in ankle deep water. That's the miracle if they crossed the Sea of Reeds. Personally, when you hear liberal preachers and, and you're in one of those churches, I wish you people would get up and, and, and say, you know, this man's a man of the devil and walk out. You know, I, I wish more Christians had spines and would confront these devils. But that's just me. Okay. All right, Exodus 12, verse 51. And it came to pass the selfsame day that the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. Do you know that the children of Israel were called, called armies? Armies! And let me tell you something, people. The scholars that translated the King James Bible. Now, I used to have a, a, a Jewish publication society, Old Testament, what they call the Tanakh, and I compared it to the King James's Old Testament, and you know what? The word orders might be a little different, but it said the same thing pretty much everywhere. There were some minor differences here and there, but it didn't change the meaning. The King James translators were scholars, all of them. There were three groups. They were independent of each other, and they all critiqued each other's work and came to a consensus. And let me tell you something. The, the people that tell you that, uh, you know, the Vatican's got... The words of God, well, you know, the Vatican put people to death. If they caught you with a Bible, they killed you. And you, you're going to tell me that the Vatican, the Pope, uh, held the true words of God? I don't think so. The King James translators knew what manuscripts were the word of God. The traditional Hebrew Masoretic text, which was the Old Testament, and the Greek majority text, the Textus Receptus, don't let anybody ever try to talk you out of your uh, King James or, or Geneva Bibles. There's some differences between the Geneva and the King James, but you know what? They're, uh, they're so close that it doesn't 
I don't see, I have yet to see anywhere where it changes any major doctrine. But the, uh, the modern Bibles stay away from them, people. They're poison. It's the serpent hissing to Eve. He shall not surely die. You know, that old serpent, the devil and Satan. And I'll tell you what, believe me, King James, use it. All right, uh, you're going to understand why I'm reading so much from Exodus. I'm going to make this part one, but I'm not finished yet. All right, in Exodus chapter 13, they leave. Um, let's see, Exodus 13, verse 20. And they, Moses and Israel, and they took their journey from Sukkoth and encamped in Etham, in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. It's funny, I did an entire Bible study on the clouds. And he had a pillar of fire by night. Didn't Jesus say in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. You know, the Lord was their light during the day. You know, a, a pillar, a cloud during the day. And what is a cloud? Do. It shades you from the sun, the heat of the sun. It gives you, it can give you rain, life-giving, you know, water. If you don't have water, you die. And then at night, fire gives you warmth. In a desert, deserts get cold. A desert might be 120 degrees during the day, but at night it gets cold. Uh, I mean... Deserts have huge temperature extremes. I mean, you could be burning up during the day and freezing at night. It's just unbelievable. But the pillar of fire gives you light and gives you warmth. You know, so the Lord provided all this. All right, let's... Uh, I'm going to finish this up with uh, the book of Exodus. And then you're going to find out why... I'm spending so much time in Exodus when I'm supposed to be talking about the eagle. Verse, chapter 14, Exodus 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Piharoth, between Migdal and the sea, over against Baal Zephon. Before it ye shall encamp by the sea. Now that B-A-A-L Z-E-P-H-O-N Baal Zephon Baal uh, is basically is just a word that means Lord but it became so used with Satanism that God said don't call me Baal anymore. So when you see a place called Baal something or other, it's not a good thing. I, mean, I can't say it's always not a good thing, but it's usually that I know of, it's almost always not a good thing. Verse 3. For peril will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land, the wilderness hath shut them in, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? You know, why did we let these people go? We, we had... We had a million slaves. Let's let's go back out and get them. 
bring him back. Oh, we were idiots. Oh, I could have had a V8. So, verse 6. And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with an, with an high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them encamping by the sea beside Pihiroth. Hiriaroth before Baal Zephon. Oh, forgive me, people. I, I'm probably pronouncing this wrong, but. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, Hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? I mean, come on, people. You saw the plagues of Egypt. You saw them smite all the firstborn. You know, these people had no faith in God whatsoever. None. Verse 12. Is not this the word? That we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians that, than that we should die in the wilderness. Now these are the people that saw the cloud by day and the, the pillar of fire by night. And now they're looking at Pharaoh and his army, and they're scared. Verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still. In other words, don't run away. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians, whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for ye, for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel, that they may, that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they will follow them, and I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen, and the angel of God which went before the camp removed and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud. Oh, that's interesting. Exodus 14, verse 19. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. So here it is, this angel of God, went was, which was leading them in the front, now goes to the back and is separating the children of Israel, from the army of the Egyptians. Okay? And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them, and it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and darkness to them, to the Egyptians, but it gave light by night to these to Israel, but it gave light by night to these, so that no one came near the other all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land. 
and the waters were divided. Don't let a lying liberal preacher tell you that the sea of reeds. Rebuke them. Tell them to go to hell. Because they probably will. Because they're lying and deceiving. Whether knowingly or just spouting the lies that they learned in liberal Bible cemetery. I mean Bible seminary. No, I was right the first time. Bible cemetery. Oh. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry land and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning, watched the Lord, looked unto the hosts of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud, and troubled the host of the Egyptians, and took off their chariot wheels, that they drave them heavily, so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. And there remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the land of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. Now remember something, people. You say, oh, that's cruel. Well, let's finish this first. And Israel saw the that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Just remember something, people. Pharaoh had ordered all the male children of Israel to be drowned into the Nile River. You know, the crocodiles, you know, babies fed to the crocodiles. Horrible. Because the people were multiplying too much. And they worked them as slaves for hundreds of years. Non-believers say that, well, that would be karma. Well, payback, people. Payback. All right, well, this is going to be the end of part one. I hope you'll stay with me and listen to part two. Um, I'm making this in response to a listener that sent me an email uh, from Canada and uh, had asked me about the... Uh, about the time of Jacob's trouble, Israel, tribulation, and God's hand of protection. Well, this is God's hand of protection. And this story is going to be probably repeated in the end times. So, stay with me, people. Please listen to part two, because I've got a point to make. All right, well, uh, and I'm going to make a point. When, when you get to the uh, end of the, st the study, I'm hoping it'll only be a part two. Might have to do a part three. You never know. All right, well, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world, and that's Jesus, who is the Christ in his precious name. Amen. <laughs>